And our first speaker today is Ji Luo, and he's a specialist in KRAS. And he got his bachelor's degree at the University of Cambridge in the UK. He did his PhD training at Harvard and was a Howard Hughes Medical Institute predoctoral fellow in the laboratory of Lewis Cantley. And his PhD research focused on PI3 kinase. And he did his postdoctoral training as an AACR fellow in the laboratory of Stephen Eldridge at Harvard Medical School. And subsequently, he came to the NCI. He's an investigator in the laboratory of cancer biology and genetics. And his title, the RAS Oncogene. Gee. Great. Uh, thank you, Terry. So since I have the mic on, I don't need to stand on the podium. So I'll probably just come over here because it's easier, easier for me to see the slides as well. So thank you for <clears throat> coming to this lecture. And you know, thank you for those who are joining us online. Um, so today I'm going to talk about, sort of give you an overview about uh, the RAS oncogene, its biology, um, and its pathology in human cancer, particularly focusing on sort of the molecular mechanism of both oncogene addiction and no oncogene addiction in RAS mutant uh, cells. And in particular, my lab's research interest is really um, a mutation in one of the family member called KRAS and in adenocarcinoma, the uh, cancer of the epithelial uh, cells in the body. Um, but I'm going to try to generalize this topic to sort of give you a, a, a sort of more um, a sort of sense of how we approach this issue of targeting an oncogene and dealing with differentiating its physiological activity from its oncogenic activity. So uh, this is the layout of the lecture. Um, I'm going to talk about a little bit about the history of the RAS oncogene because I think um, you know uh, it's always good to know where things started. But more importantly, I think for this audience, you'll see that in fact the RAS oncogene is 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 very dear to the NCI intramural program. In fact, a lot of the early discoveries on this topic was done here by many of the prominent scientists. Some of them are still working here. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the background of how the RAS signaling pathway um, um, and, and its uh, and and its function in oncogenesis. And then I'm going to talk about sort of uh, um, uh, targeted therapy strategies uh, that have been undertaken to target RAS, the RAS signaling network. And then sort of um, the fourth area which I will touch upon, which is what my lab's interest um, lies in, is, is synthetic lethal interactions uh, with the RAS oncogene and the, on the oncogenic stress phenotype in cancer cells. And I'll talk a little bit about some of the work that's done in the immunotherapy front. That, you know, that's totally outside of my area of expertise, but I wanted to bring it to your attention because some, there's some really exciting uh, development again within the NCI uh, intramural program that I wanted you to be aware of. Then I'll sort of uh, wrap it up and you know try to generalize some of the principles we can learn from studying the RAS oncogene. So the history of RAS goes back into the 60s. In fact, RAS oncogenes were initially um, uh, identified as as basically sarcoma viruses um, in mice um, by two um, by, by two scientists, Harvey and Kirsten, uh, separately. And this turned out later to be the H and KRAS oncogene uh, ortho, uh, uh, viral um, par, uh, orthologs. But back then, it was really just uh, oncogenic activity in a, in a virus. Uh, nobody knows what about their molecular characteristics. And then almost 10, uh, more than 10 years later, uh, Ed Skolnick, um, uh, when he was um, working at the NCI, I started to characterize the um, oncoprotein that are produced by these transforming viruses more carefully. And he characterized the molecular weight of this protein. It turned out to be around 21 kilodalton. And he also noticed that this protein actually binds to GTP, and which was the first insight about the molecular mechanism of how these oncoproteins work. And then he also made, uh, later on, an important observation. His group made observation that this protein appears to be localized to the plasma membrane, which again is an important piece in the puzzle of how the RAS oncogene work. And then the breakthroughs in terms of relevance to human cancer really came in the early 80s when multiple groups working uh, independently um, discover a whole set of principles, uh, including uh, Ed Skolnick, Dr. Lawis group, he's still here, Mariano Barbaric's group when he was working at the NCI, as well as uh, um, 
um, Bob Weinberg, Mike Wiggler, and uh, George Cooper, uh, Jeff Cooper's uh, uh, labs in Boston. And what they realized was that it turns out that these viral oncogenes have a very closely related human counterpart in human cells. And uh, um, uh, I won't go into the details, but suffice to say that they were able to show that, in fact, there are oncogenic sequences from human tumor cells that look very similar to the same sequences that were found in the viruses. And then, um, very soon, all of these groups realized that the oncogenic version of the human gene is not exactly what we call wild type. In fact, they noticed that it carries a point mutation. And again, this is another important piece of the molecular mechanism of how this protein, now called RAS, um, is able to transform cells. So they, they were able to show that, in fact, the oncogenic version of this protein carries important amino a, a nucleotide uh, substitution that leads to a single amino acid chain. And then, uh, uh, sort of um, the definitive proof that the, in fact the gene product is translated into a protein and the protein itself is a transforming entity. You know, this also sort of seems like a given nowadays, but back in those days, it's not necessarily clear whether the DNA or the RNA or the protein is in fact the oncogenic species. And so um, several groups, um, most uh, particularly Dennis Stacy's group, have done sort of the experiment where you can produce the oncoprotein in vitro and then micro-inject it into individual cells. And they show that by meticulously injecting many uh, cells that whenever you directly put this mutant protein into the cell, you can transform them. And so this established the definitive link that this viral oncogene is producing a mutant protein that carries an amino acid substitution um, that is by itself sufficiently uh, able to either drive <clears throat> a quiescent cells into proliferation or uh, lead to transformation of otherwise uh, non-transformed cells. And then uh, very soon, <clears throat> the molecular mechanism of this RAS protein became uh, more clear. It turns out that <clears throat> the, uh, because you remember early on that Sconey had already made the observation that this protein binds to GTP, and it turns out that these proteins actually hydrolyze GTP, they're GTPases. Uh, and the very peculiar point mutation in these proteins that are found in cancer cells, and what they do is that they prevent this protein from executing its normal activity of hydrolyzing GTP. So this immediately suggests the mechanism of why this mutation is selected, is perhaps this GTPA's activity is important uh, for whatever the function of RAS protein. And then a few years later, uh, Frank McCormick's lab cloned the first so-called gap protein or GTPase active protein that turns that stimulates GTP hydrolysis on RAS protein. And it later became clear that in fact this is a dynamic cycle of turning RAS proteins on and off in order to control its cellular activity. So that was sort of the early history of RAS protein. Um, and, and, and once sort of the molecular mechanism begins to get unraveled, then our, our understanding of how RAS protein uh, work in the cells um, has become um, uh, sort of a, the whole field has exploded in terms of how quickly it advanced, uh, our, our understanding uh, advanced. So it turns out that in the human genome, there are three closely related members of the RAS gene family, uh, HRAS. This, sort of, this was the close, this in fact, this is the, uh, the, the, the human uh, orthologue of the Harvey RAS, um, v -RAS, viral RAS protein. And RAS, is an, it's originally cloned from neuronal cells. Um, and KRAS, this is a cursing version um, of the RAS, uh, uh, the, the murine RAS protein. So um, in addition to these three genes, the KRAS gene actually produces two proteins called KRAS4A and KRAS4B. And they were basically uh, different uh, through an alternative splicing mechanism in the C terminal. And if you line up the three RAS family members, they are very, very homologous. In fact, and the majority of their sequence, so-called the G domain or the GTPase domain, is very, very highly um, homologous with very few amino acid differences. The most of the amino acid differences occur in the C terminus of these proteins. I'll, I'll talk about this in a little bit. Um, but by and large, um, these proteins perform similar biochemical functions, although they have um, 
find functional differences that might have uh, dictated their uh, different spectrum of, of mutation in human cancer. And, and in fact, in this G domain, which the protein uses to hydrolyze GTP, it undergoes a very large conformational change. And this conformational change is pr primarily conveyed through two uh, regions called switch one and switch two uh, regions that RAS proteins use to talk to its downstream effectors. So, uh, in fact, the molecular mechanism of how RAS is activated and then turned off is, is, is simplified in this scheme where under, under resting conditions, RAS is bound to GDP and it's inactive. And typically, it's activated by receptor tyrosine kinases, but it can also be activated by other uh, stimuli such as GPCRs. Uh, and, and when receptor tyrosine kinases are activated, it basically recruits RAS GDP to a complex um, on the receptor through the activity of another family of proteins called GTP a GTP GDP exchange factor, so GAFs. RAS will shed its GDP and load GTP. And with GTP loading, RAS undergoes a large conformational change. And this, this is transmitted through the two switch domains in the uh, RAS protein. And this allows it to talk to its various downstream effectors. And normally in the cells, there is another family of proteins uh, I've already mentioned called the GTPase activating proteins. And these proteins actively stimulate the GTP hydrolysis activity of RAS and turns it off. So RAS is really a molecular toggle switch. It responds to upstream mitogenic signaling and it turns on and in turn it talks to a whole bunch of downstream effector pathways. And then when it's done with its function, it's turned off by gap protein. And so how does the membrane localization of RAS come to play? As you, as you remember that, in fact, Ascone has made a very early observation that um, RAS proteins are localized to the plasma membrane. So in fact, the RAS proteins undergo a complex C-terminal processing step. Uh, it's far isolated on assisting residue. And then this allows it to be, uh, uh, allows it to be associated with the membrane through this fatty acid tail. And then its, it's C-terminus is further clipped by two enzymes, RCE1 and ICMT. Um, and in the case of KRAS4B, this is sufficient for it to, for RAS protein to go to the membrane. Whereas uh, in the case of HRAS, NRAS, and the KRAS4A variants, it also undergoes an additional palmitolation step on another cysting residue near its C terminus. And this uh, helps RAS localize to the plasma membrane. So the, the reason RAS needs to go to the plasma membrane is because that's where its receptors are. So, and, and so this, as a signaling molecule, it really allows the cell to sense extracellular mitogenic stimuli and then convert this signal um, into intracellular responses. And this is sort of the canonical RAS signaling network, um, fairly up to date. Um, <coughs> RAS, through its switch domains, can talk to a number of downstream effector proteins or share uh, the same features that they have so-called RAS binding domain, that they can talk to RAS when RAS is GTP bound. Uh, a major prominent pathway downstream of RAS, many of you probably heard of um, already, is the MAP kinase pathway. It's through a kinase cascade involving RAF, MEK, and ERK kinases that, in, that ultimately leads to the phosphorylation and activation of a bunch of transcriptional factors. And one of the major role of the MAP kinase pathway, in addition to its other role, is to drive cell cycle entry from G1 to S phase. And this, this appears to be a key function of the RAS signaling pathway as a mitogenic signaling uh, pathway. And in addition, oops, uh, RAS also talks to uh, the PI3 kinase AKT TOR pathway. And it saw that this process, um, at least it occurs in some cells, doesn't may not occur in all cells, is coordinating cell cycle entry to cell growth, protein translation, and cell survival. And in addition, RAS can talk to several other small GTPases, such as Rho, RAT, and Rouse, and this coordinately regulates uh, cell motility, uh, as well as additional uh, transcriptional program. So as you can see that, because RAS can control multiple processes in uh, cell proliferation, cell survival, and cell growth, it is the ideal oncogene, because if you can activate RAS, then you can turn on all of these processes, and many of these uh, and then, then this leads to uh, basically you uncouple 
um, cell proliferation and cell survival from mitogen controls, and these are hallmarks of cancer. So, in fact, RAS genes are one of the most frequently mutated oncogenes uh, in human cancer. 30% of all human cancer carry mutations in one of the RAS genes, but KRAS by far share, uh, take the lion's share of mutations among the three family members, K, H, and R, and N, and the reason for this, in fact, is not entirely clear. And uh, KRAS mutation is particularly high in pancreatic cancer. Almost all pancreatic cancer are essentially driven by KRAS mutation. Also, approximately 45% of colorectal adenocarcinoma, as well as 35% of non small cell lung cancer, uh, are driven by mutations in the KRAS oncogene. And you probably can't see this very well. I just provided here for informational purpose that many other types of epithelial cancer also uh, carry mutations in the RAS genes as well as some. Um, uh, liquid cancer. And this is uh, the frequency of distribution of mutations across the three family members, HRAS, KRAS, and NRAS in all cancers. As you can see, there are really three major hotspots, uh, G12, G13, and Q61. The reason that these three amino acids are primarily the hotspots for mutation uh, will be apparent on the next slide. Uh, and this immediately suggests that you know when you see a poor mutation like this, it's typically a gain of function mutation uh, in this protein. And then uh, if you look at, uh, uh, P uh, this is pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma, colorectal cancer, and lung adenocarcinoma. Most of the mutations in RAS proteins are in the G12 residue. Again, I'll explain to this very, uh, very quickly. But what's, in, but, but what's unclear why, um, uh, what's unclear is why different types of cancers have different preference for the G12 amino acid mutation. For example, the G12C mutation is primarily found in lung adenocarcinoma, but relatively, it, but occurs at a very low frequency in colorectal and uh, pancreatic ductal carcinoma. And in fact, the reason I single this G12C mutation out is that this is the only, this is the only mutant that's tractable for uh, targeted therapy at the moment. So why do we see these mutations um, in the RAS oncogene? It turns out that, as I mentioned, RAS is an intrinsic GTPase, except it's a chromium one. It hydrolyzes GTP very slowly. And the family of gap proteins accelerate this process by physically interacting with the GTP hydrolysis catalytic site. So, -called, uh, so the gap proteins insert a so-called arginine finger into the GTP um, catalytic site in RAS proteins. And this helps to accelerate the GTP hydrolysis rate of RAS proteins by over a thousand fold. So this is a very efficient mechanism to turn off uh, otherwise very potent mitogenic signal process. But if you look at the crystal structure of wild type RAS protein here, looking right down at the GTP binding pocket, and the mutant protein where the G12 amino acid is mutated to aspartic acid. So, so, G, so, so glycine is very small, it has no side chain, right? It's a, whereas aspartic acid has a very chunky side chain. You can see that the, the basically what this mutation does is that it covers up this gap that exists in the wild protein where the gap protein can access to, hydro, to help RAS hydrolyze this GTP. So this physically precludes the RAS arginine finger from sticking into the RAS protein. And this therefore, essentially lock RAS in its GTP bound form because of its inherent slow GTP hydrolysis rate. And so unlike the wild type situation where most of the RAS protein in the cell exists in the inactive GTP form, and it's only activated by when, recept when upstream re re mitogenic signaling is turned on and talks to its effector, then it's quickly turned off by the gap protein. When you have an oncogenic mutation in RAS proteins, this off process is dramatically disabled. So you started to accumulate a lot of GDP bound active RAS protein, and this leads to high levels and constitutive activation of RAS signaling that's uncoupled from upstream control by the cyclotarsin kinase here. And in fact, if you look at the three major cancer types, lung, pancreatic, and colorectal adenocarcinomas, um, a mutation in the KRAS gene occurs very early in the early neoplastic state. So we think that at least in the lawn, in the pancreatic setting, KRAS mutation, in fact, is an initiating factor. It occurs very early, and this drives neoplastic transformation. 
And of course, later on, when you have mutations in P53 and so forth, you can make tumor more aggressive. In the colorectal cancer setting, in fact, RAS, we think, is a progression factor. The, as you all know, colorectal cancer requires mutation in the APC uh, beta catenin pathway, which is required to, uh, to, lock the, to, to, to prevent uh, differentiation and lock the cells in the stem cell state. And then in addition, if you have RAS mutation, this, this, this promotes um, uh, the uh, a proliferation as well as um, sort of uh, the, 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 uh, from the neoplastic to the adenoma a tr a transition of colorectal cancer. So as I mentioned, the reason RAS oncogene is such a great oncogene is that because it can activate a number of downstream effector pathways, MAP kinase, PF3 kinase, and so forth. And this coordinately control cell proliferation, cell survival, cell metabolism, cell motility, and so forth. So in one single mutation, you can turn on all of these pro-oncogenic pathways. And in fact, in vivo, what we know is that, whereas normally your epithelial cells can only survive if it's in, in contact with the basement membrane, and any cell that divided out of um, uh, uh, the plane uh, will undergo apoptosis. But if you, if you introduce a KRAS mutation, now cells can divide and self-renewal irrespective of adhesion to the um, epithelial mononayer, uh, the basement membrane. But what's really important and what is really pertinent to cancer therapy against KRAS mutation is that this process of KRAS transformation is completely reversible, at least in preclinical models. And we think it's also true in, uh, in, in patient, in many patients, is that if you take KRAS mutant tumors and you eliminate the KRAS oncogene, you can lead to either cessation of cell proliferation or cell death by apoptosis or other mechanism. And this has been classically characterized as oncogene addi addiction by Weistein and colleagues. And in fact, oncogene addiction is the basis of practically all oncogene targeted therapies, including BRAF and EGFR mutant uh, inhibitors. So only because the tumor cells are continuously dependent on the presence of one of the key drivers throughout the life cycle of the tumor that targeting the oncogene all of, or its downstream signaling pathway would provide a therapeutic window uh, in tumor cells versus normal tissue. So um, <clears throat> based on what we know about the, the molecular pathways of RAS, we can uh, devise, you can think of sev several strategies to target RAS signaling. Clearly the most direct strategy is to target the RAS oncoprotein itself, but this turns out to be rather difficult, unlike the case of kinases such as um, BRAF, EGFR, ALK, and so forth. Because RAS is a membrane-localized protein, we can uh, try to prevent it from going to the membrane by targeting the various enzymes that are necessary for its membrane localization. Whoops, I apologize for this uh, uh, MAC to PC problem. Uh, clearly, we can target the various effector kinase uh, downstream of RAS that convey the mitogenic signaling from RAS to the nucleus and other processes. I'll talk a little bit about targeting uh, the various synthetic lethal mechanisms that are necessary to support the malignant phenotype of RAS mutant cells. And this primarily concerns the various oncogenic stress phenotypes. But so far, uh, none of these strategies have panned out in the clinic. And I'll explain some of the reasons why this is and what we can do to try to help the situation. So in fact, RAS mutation really is the elephant in the room in terms of cancer therapy because 30% of, 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 of all human tumors are driven by RAS mutation and we currently don't have an effective targeted therapies uh, for this class of tumor. So it's a really urgent and unmet therapeutic need. So very early on, once the molecular pathway that localized RAS to the membrane was discovered, um, inhibitors has been developed to target various components in this pathway, particularly the foreign cell transferase, which is the very first prenylation step uh, of RAS protein. And this is one of the, uh, the, the inhibitor called tipifarinib that's advanced in the clinic. But the problem with targeting RAS protein um, membrane localization is that it turns out that if you block foreign cell transferase activity, RAS can undergo an alternative membrane localization process called geronal geronalation that's mediated by geronal geronal transferase. And of course, you can also make an inhibitor to target this enzyme. But the problem is that many other small GTPases in the RAS superfamily that localizes to the plasma membrane utilize the exact same C-terminal uh, prenylation pathway. So drugs of this nature 
lack inherent selectivity for RAS proteins. And this is, has been one of the confounding issues in their lack of clinical activity, in addition to alternative mechanism to localize RAS proteins to the membrane. <coughs> and then you could say, okay, um, we could um, basically compete with GTP, right? Just like kinase inhibitors. Kinase inhibitor, most of the kinase inhibitors compete with ATP binding in the, in the catalytic uh, pocket of kinases, and that's how they block their activity. So we can block GTP binding in RAS proteins. It turns out that this is chemically very challenging because RAS proteins bind to GTP with an affinity that's magnitudes higher than kinases bind to ATP. So it's very, very difficult to devise a small, to devise a small molecule that would effectively compete with GTP for RAS binding. And they could, then, you know, then we could also try to develop molecules that block the interaction between RAS proteins and its downstream effector proteins, such as RAF kinase, because as you, may, as you remember, this is mediated through the switch domain on RAS protein and the RAS binding domain on its effector protein. So you could theoretically devise RAS binding domain inhibitors that disrupt this protein-protein interaction. But as you, many of you are aware of, that disrupting protein-protein interaction is difficult. It's particularly difficult in this case because this interaction surface is large and relatively flat. So it's really hard to find a small molecule that would effectively bind to one of the two surfaces and prevents the other protein uh, from binding. And targeting RAS protein itself <clears throat> has been rather difficult because RAS turns out to be what we call a Teflon molecule. There's, there's not a lot of good purchase on the, on, the, on the structure that allows you to insert a small molecule with high affinity and disrupt its activity. Uh, but, but recently, um, there has been some progress made against the G12C mutant of KRAS protein. As you remember, this occurs um, in about a quarter of lung cancer. And this is a clever strategy uh, initially pioneered by Kivan Shokat's lab, where they basically devised a suicide inhibitor that can cross-link to the cysting residue on this G12C mutant. So it's really only targeting the mutant protein because this is a, a, a new amino acid that's not present in a wild-type protein. And it's also accessible because it's near the surface of the protein. And this inhibitor works by a peculiar mechanism where once it's bound to, um, once it's cross-linked to the G12C mutant, in fact, it prefers the GTP state of the protein, but it prevents the next cycle of GTP to GTP exchange on KRAS. And this gradually locks all the KRAS mutant protein in the GTP-bound state and therefore shuts off oncogenic RAS signaling. And so this drug, um, a, a version of this drug has recently entered phase one clinical trial, and this is really the very first uh, uh, sort of RAS inhibitor that's um, um, that sort of um, uh, that has a very tractable mechanism of action that's likely to um, see benefits at least in a small uh, fraction of patients that have the KRAS G12C uh, mutation in their tumor. And because many of the RAS effector pathways, as you recognize, are classic protein kinases, and we know how to drug them very well now. Um, over the years, a large amount of effort has been focused on developing inhibitors that target the various downstream kinase effectors of the mutant RAS protein. For example, RAF kinase, MEK kinase, and ERK kinases all have very good kinase inhibitors that's been developed, as well as kinase, kinase inhibitors targeting PSU kinase, uh, which is a lipid kinase, as well as AKT and TOR uh, in the PS3 kinase TOR pathway. Uh, but so far, these inhibitors that target RAS effectors have not done very well in the clinic for reasons that are both simple and complex, and I'll, I'll, elude, them, uh, I'll, I'll elude to in a bit. So why there's, has there been so much effort focused on targeting the MAP kinase pathway downstream of RAS? It's because over the years, there's been a tremendous body of literature suggesting that this MAP kinase pathway is the essential pathway RAS used to drive cell proliferation. And one of the experiments that's elegantly done by Mariano Barbasit's lab recently uh, was this. They took RAS wild-type cells and knocked out all three RAS forms, KRAS, HRAS, and NRAS, so they created this so-called RAS-less cell. Without RAS proteins at all, these cells cannot proliferate. And then they could ask the, the, the sort of the classic genetic rescue experiment uh, question of, you know, if you put back activating mutant of each of these major effector pathway downstream of RAS, which of these will rescue cell proliferation? And it turns out that any mutation 
in RAF MAC or ERK in the MAP kinase pathway can restore proliferation in RAS-less cells. On the other hand, activating mutations in the PR3 kinase or the RAU GDS pathways cannot do so, but they can cooperate with mutations in the MAP kinase pathway to promote um, mutation, uh, proliferation in RAS-less cells. So it's experiments like this type that's, that firmly establish the MAP kinase pathway as a viable target downstream of mutant RAS. So, but it turns out the reality is always a little complicated than, um, uh, than, than, you know, um, than our concept, our model. Um, we have really good inhibitors at targeting RAF kinase, the top kinase in the MAP kinase cascade. And one of the a drug that's being approved uh, is uh, vemurafenib. It's approved for BRAF mutant melanoma, where, uh, where you have activating mutations in RAF kinase, and this um, drives melanoma in about, I think, 70% of melanoma. And, and vemurafenib is very good at inhibiting the mutant BRAF protein. However, in the mutant RAS context, we're asking these drugs to inhibit wild-type RAF proteins downstream of an activating uh, RAS, and it turns out that because of the peculiar mechanism of how RAF kinase is activated through an asymmetric dimerization process, these drugs, turns out at physiologically achievable dose, can activate this pathway rather than inhibit the MAP kinase pathway because one RAF monomer that's inhibited by a RAF inhibitor can serve as a scaffold and transactivate the other RAF monomer that's not inhibited by the drug. And it turns out that within the physiological range of what well, we can use this drug without over toxicity, this is what happens in the RAS mutant cells. So these drugs are so-called paradoxical activators of this pathway. And they actually taught us about previously unknown mechanism of how RAF kinases are activated. So uh, there are efforts to develop drugs that do not have this paradoxical activating uh, property. Um, and hopefully these drugs will do better in RAS mutant tumors. And MEK kinases have also received a ton of attention, as well as ERK kinases, as drug targets. But it turns out that drugs that target MEK and ERK kinases have limited utility because of all of these negative feedback me mechanisms that's built into the MAP kinase pathway at various levels, in including the activation of receptor uh, of uh, phosphatases that turn these proteins off, as well as proteins such as sprouting and spreads that prevents RAS signaling upstream. And so when you have a drug such as trametinib, which is also approved um, in the context uh, of BRAF mutant melanoma, when you try to block MEK kinase in the middle of the MAP kinase cascade, this has a transient effect on blocking signaling in the MAP kinase pathway. But then once you block this pathway, you basically relieve all of these um, negative inhibition um, feedback loop. So you, you, you dial up all of these feedback activation mechanisms. And this leads to increased signaling upstream of MEK. And this diminish the, um, the durability of MEK kinase as well as ERK kinase inhibition. And again, we had to think about strategies, how to overcome this feedback mechanism that's natural to the MAP, uh, RAS MAP kinase signaling pathway. And perhaps one of the most sobering study was uh, published this year. This is a phase three clinical trial in non-small cell lung cancer patients that are selected for uh, uh, KRAS mutation. So in this study, uh, there were uh, 500 patients all have KRAS mutations in their uh, lung tumor. And they were basically randomized in a classic one-to-one -one, uh, format. Uh, one of them, uh, one group received docetaxel, the standard of care chemotherapy. Um, and the other group received a combination of docetaxel plus a MEK inhibitor called selumetinib. This is actually one of the most selective and potent inhibitors out there. And if you look at the overall survival curve, in fact, the combination group where we actually added a targeted therapy for MEK kinases have done a little bit worse than the standard of care docetaxel group. And this is primarily due to combination toxicity of drug. But then you have to think about you know, just because chemo is our standard of care, is this a reasonable combination? And, and, and there, are, there are reasons to think that this may not be the optimal combination to deliver in RAS mutant cells because we know the MAP kinase pathway contr primarily controls G1S transition, whereas <coughs> taxo molecules primarily 
uh, hit cells in mitosis because these are microtubule stabilizers. So if you have two drugs that each exerts its activity in a different part of the cell cycle, then you could envision that by adding a G1S transition inhibitor, uh, such as the MEK inhibitor cellulometidib, into this mix, you are in fact preventing tax cell from killing cells in the later stage of the in the later stage of the cell cycle. So when we think about combination therapies using targeted therapies, um, we had to really think about the mechanism of action and how these drug these combinations might syner be synergistic. And in fact, there are many other combination therapies involving two targeted, targeted agents, all based on MEK inhibitor as a backbone. Um, so you target the MAP kinase pathway plus another pathway that might be important for mutant KRAS activity, such as PS3 kinase inhibitor, EGFR inhibitor, TOR inhibitor, and CDK4, CDK6 inhibitor. And these are in various stages of clinical evaluation right now. But a key concern is that many of these pathways are also required for physiological RAS signaling in normal cells. As I mentioned, RAS is a mitogen, a key mitogenic signaling molecule that your stem cell, your progenitor cells often rely on this pathway for just normal tissue renewal or wound repair. So the concern is that when you have this sort of combination that target multiple essential pathways in normal cells, can patients tolerate them well? And we know that the combination of MEK plus PS3 kinase inhibitors have clearly exacerbated toxicities compared to each of these single agents alone. Oops. Okay. So clearly, a combination therapy is the way to go, and monoagent mono -agent therapies are unlikely to have either initial benefits or durable impact. But the question with combination therapy, in fact, is not toxicity. We have plenty of drugs that are really, really toxic. It's just that at the maximum toxicity patients can tolerate, they have no anti-tumor activity. The key of combination therapy is a selectivity or therapeutic window, as you all know. In fact, most cancer therapies have relatively narrow therapeutic window, except uh, agents um, that have very interesting mechanism of action that clearly discriminate oncogenic um, uh, tumor cells, uh, uh, clearly discriminates a, a tumor cell driven by a particular oncogene versus normal cells. So, so we want it to, this therapeutic window to be as wide as possible. We don't, we don't want things to be very toxic. We want a very wide therapeutic window so that at the, toxic, at the drug concentration that you could be very toxic to cancer cells, you, you would still be having relatively little toxicity in normal tissue. So in fact, a good combination therapy needs to confer what we call genotype-specific synergy. So in other words, each of the drug in the combination has some degree of selectivity for cancer cells, either because of a particular mutation or, or a particular oncogenic phenotype. And in fact, when you put two drugs together, you don't want to narrow th the therapeutic window. That's, a, that's probably not a very good recipe for combining drugs. You want to, the combination to be truly synergistic and widen the therapeutic window so you can kill cancer cells with less of each drug without eliciting significant toxicities in normal tissue. And of course, as you all know, a major point of combining drugs is to delay the onset of drug resistance because you want to make it harder for tumor cells to evade a particular inhibitor um, by, 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 by trying to kill it with several other inhibitors of orthogonal mechanisms of action. So resistance to one agent does not lead to resistance to an, the other agent. And this leads to the idea of synthetic lethality. In fact, this is a concept as old as RAS itself. Uh, it was originally developed in East uh, by Hartwell and colleagues. Uh, and what this really basically says is, is, is to care, is, 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 is synthetic lethality really characterize um, <clears throat> the ability of, of, of a, a, a complex network to have genetic buffering and pathway redundancy property. So um, the very sort of abstract definition of synthetic lethality is that when you have two genes that could buffer each other's activity, then loss or mutation of each of these two genes, we call A and B, it doesn't matter which one, uh, what they are, the cells can tolerate it because the other gene can take over the function. But if you simultaneously alter or lose the function of both genes, then the cell run out of buffering capacity and this leads to um, loss of viability. So this is a basic concept of synthetic lethality. Of course, in the context of RAS mutation, what we wanted to find is that if we have a cancer cell that's mutant for KRAS, can we find other genes 
whose loss of function could lead to the demise of KRAS mutant cells, but not KRAS wild type cells because of this genetic buffering. And of course, if we can find such genes, they could serve as interesting uh, drug target uh, in the KRAS mutant context. And there are many examples of synthetic lethality in cancer. For example, uh, obviously, if you have uh, oncogenic activations in a pathway, then targeting downstream um, of the oncogenic pathway would be a form of synthetic lethality, except you know, we tend not to talk about, we, don't, we tend not to say that synthetic lethality, we, we simply describe this as pathway addiction. And then a lot of synthetic lethality comes from stress pathway um, responses, such as uh, targeting proteasome uh, in the case of multiple myeloma, because these, these cells are a highly, prote uh, they, they experience high, a high degree of proteotoxicity. Uh, targeting topoisomerase in DNA replication in cancer cells. Uh, you, uh, I think E. Pomier gave a lecture um, a while ago about this. Uh, and then uh, targeting DNA repair mechanism where if you lose BRCA proteins that are involved in homologous repair, then no homologous end joining through the PARP um, enzymes are essential now. And you could kill cells with BRCA mutant with PARP inhibitor. And there are other uh, mechanism of less obvious synthetic lethality, such as loss of paralog function. If you, uh, in cancer cells, deleted for every 1A protein, then every 1B became essential. <coughs> and uh, interestingly, this so-called collateral lethality, where if you delete, if, if, if you have a, a strong tumor suppressor, such, such as CDKN2A, its deletion is often imprecise, and you often take out its neighboring gene that's very close to CDKN2A, called MTAP. And now, again, this renders the cell sensitive to proteasome inhibitors because MTAP is involved in proteasome function. And then uh, if you have widespread um, loss of uh, heterozygosity, um, uh, so-called um, hemizygous deletion in cancer, then you could have a dosage-dependent synthetic lethality. So there are many avenues to target cancer cells based on the concept of synthetic lethality that, that broadens our drug target space beyond immediately mutant oncogene or their downstream effector pathway. So in addition to what I've described as oncogene addiction in KRAS mutant cells, because KRAS mutant cells are continuously dependent on this hyperactive RAC signaling for their proliferation and survival, we now know that these cells also experience a wide range of oncogenic stress. This includes metabolic stress, DNA damage, genomic instability, proteotoxic stress, reactive oxygen species damage, as well as immuno checkpoints. And we now know that cancer cells are continuously dependent on cellular stress response pathways to suppress this family of oncogenic stress to maintain their viability. So we think that if we could devise strategies to target these unique forms of oncogenic stress that are seen in cancer cells but not seen in normal cells, we can then devise orthogonal drug combinations that, in collaboration with drugs that target RAS signaling pathway, can potentially boost the synergistic effect in the KRAS mutant specific context. Oh, I'm very sorry. Uh, uh, this is just to show that over the years, we've, uh, uh, we've characterized a number of synthetic lethal interactions in KRAS mutant cells that are involved in specific components in RNA splicing machinery, as well as the protein simulation pathway, which is a stress response pathway. And this slide summarizes um, our work and many other labs work that characterize various forms of synthetic lethal interactions in KRAS mutant cells. These, involving, uh, these involve uh, parallel survival signaling pathway involving TDK1 and TAC1 kinases. Uh, alternative transcriptional program, including the GATA and snail transcription factors, various form of survival mechanism that's involved in uh, genomic instability, such as surviving TPX2, PLK, uh, PLK1, the anaphase promoting complex, and proteasome, all involved in uh, chromosome segregation in mitosis, as well as surviving uh, uh, anti-apoptotic pathways, such as those involving WP1 and BCLXL, that basically suppress cell deaths induced by oncogenic stress. But all of these synthetic lethal mechanisms turned out to have a tissue and genetic context. So none of these synthetic lethal mechanisms have, tur have turned out to be a golden bullet where you could 
used to kill all KRAS mutant cells e effective. And in fact, we don't expect this to be the case because we know cancer is, is, is an extremely heterogeneous disease. And we think that, in fact, the best way to apply this is to, uh, is to take some of these synthetic lethal mechanisms and, and, and allow them and target them in cooperation with targeting KRAS oncogenic signaling pathway. So um, I will, uh, in, in the interest of time, um, I will uh, go over this quickly, but uh, one way that my lab has devised um, a, a strategy to, to interrogate rationally what are the optimal target combination and what are the key oncogen, oncogenic effector pathways as well as synthetic lethal pathway in KRAS mutant cells is through this combinatorial sRNA platform where, could, where we could co-target up to seven genes simultaneously in the same cell. And we interrogated all the canonical RAS effector pathways as well as a number of stress response and synthetic lethal pathways in the KRAS mutant context where we systematically look at 47 uh, RAS effector genes and 29 stress response genes that constitute 29 gene nodes. And then we'll look at all 378 genome pairs to systematically ask the question how the oncogene addiction uh, mechanism of KRAS is partitioned through its, this various downstream signaling pathway and stress response pathways. And what are the key nodes we could hit in order to maximize the toxicity in KRAS mutant cells and minimize the toxicity in KRAS wild type cells? And to cut a very long story short, we interrogated these various gene combinations in KRAS mutant colorectal and uh, pancreatic ductal carcinoma cell lines and compared their toxicity in wild type cancer cells as well as untransformed normal cell lines. And what we found is that in fact, the RAF kinase node that's just being published is a key uncle effector downstream from mutant KRAS. And also the RAC uh, GTPase, which is involved in cytoskeletal uh, array arrangement also helps in conveying the oncogenic signaling of mutant KRAS. And of the various stress response pathways, the autophagy pathway is a key suppressor of oncogenic stress when uh, the MAP kinase pathway is acutely inhibited. So we think that combined targeting of RAF kinases, uh, which uh, for reasons I won't go into, we think is actually superior than targeting MAC and ERK kinases, in, combinations, uh, in combination with targeting the autophagy pathway could be a viable and rational targeted uh, combination um, that uh, exhibit synergistic effect in the KRAS mutant context. So um, we can't ignore immunotherapy because it has been really a transforming um, uh, uh, area in, the, in recent years, except that there's no particular indication that KRAS mutant cells respond particularly well to immunotherapy. As you, as you remember, pancreatic cancer, lung cancer, and colorectal cancer have high frequencies of KRAS mutation, but there's no, so far there's no clinical indication that KRAS mutation itself confers any uh, particular advantage in responding to checkpoint inhibitors targeting either PDL1 or uh, PD1 um, proteins. Uh, in fact, there is preclinical evidence that suggests otherwise. So in fact, there's evidence such as in cancer cells, a mutant KRAS can increase the expression of the checkpoint protein PDL1, and you, you know that this by engaging PD1 protein on T cells suppresses T cell response. So, in fact, if anything, having a KRAS mutation might be bad for immunotherapy because this will increase the expression of PDL1 uh, ligand on cancer cells. But on the uh, adoptive T cell transfer um, transplant front, uh, works from uh, 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 Dr. Rosenberg as well as uh, Jimmy Ann's lab. Uh, Dr. Dr. Yan's lab at the uh, at in the NCI intramural program has really uh, turned up some really interesting um, responses. So here's a patient where they found that has a T cell um, that react to this particular G12D mutant peptide uh, that's being presented on her, um, I believe, colorectal cancer, and by um, isolating these T cells, amplifying them, and putting them back into the patient, they could get incredibly good tumor regression in this particular patient. Of course, there are a lot of uh, sort of um, nuances as to why this patient respond. Uh, and this, in fact, is a rare responder. But nevertheless, this suggests that we could have a very highly specific and highly efficacious targeted therapy against the particular um, very, uh, uh, mutant peptides that are in KRAS proteins. As you remember, 
these are the key oncog oncogenes and oncoproteins that the tumor cells are continuously addicted to. So it's, it, it might be difficult for them to evade this sort of therapy. So this, again, is, is very promising, although in early stages, that immunotherapy, in particular in terms of um, cell-based therapies, can, can be, um, uh, can be uh, particularly efficacious in this class of KRAS mutant tumors right now that we have a lot of trouble in treating uh, with target therapy. So um, in closing, um, this is sort of our holistic view of cancer therapy. We know that cancer is a heterogeneous disease. Um, it, has, um, it has both a, a tumor component as well as a stromal component that involve a blood vessel, stromal uh, support, as well as immunosurveillance. And there are a whole bunch of tumor cell intrinsic factor, which is what mostly I talk about today, about mutant KRAS, how its signaling pathway drives oncogenic transformation. Um, that leads to the tumorigenic phenotype. But at the same time, there's a whole host of tumor cell extrinsic factors, such as immunosurveillance, that also is involved in the development and pro, uh, progression of the tumor. And ultimately, we think that we, we have to think about combining these various um, approaches to targeting both tumor in, intrinsic uh, activities as well as tumor cell extrinsic factors in order to effectively control this tumor. And I spend a lot of time talking about how um, stress response pathways and no oncogenic addictions are a critical component of the um, malignant phenotype. And in the, in the past, a lot of drug development effort has been focused on directly targeting oncogenes or its signaling pathway, whereas I think now we clearly see utilities in targeting no oncogenic addictions or stress response pathways in cancer cells that could also boost um, the, um, the uh, efficacy of uh, drug combinations. And ultimately, I think if you think about drug combination, particularly you know, taking what we know about HIV drug combination therapy as a lesson, is that we need multiple therapies. Each of them must have two important features. One is that they must have some degree of selectivity for the cancer cells. We don't want things that like chemotherapy. that has no clear uh, genetic basis of selectivity. But more importantly, these drugs must have orthogonal mechanisms of action. And that's where true synergy comes from. So you want, you want drugs that target KRAS proteins directly. You want drugs that target RAS effector kinases. You want drugs that target synthetic lethal partners of KRAS and stress response pathways in KRAS immune cells. And you also want drugs that target tumor microenvironment and immuno checkpoint. And because each of these inhibitors can have a particular mechanism action that's independent of the other drugs, and they each have a particular uh, a, a mechanism of cancer-specific selectivity, by combining them, I think this is what will have to be the way for us to control this particular difficult classes of uh, tumors that have RAS mutations. So uh, with this, I'd like to end and uh, thank the various collaborators uh, we've had over the years in, in helping our own work, and thank you for your attention. So one thing we've learned um, uh, about KRAS with CRISPR, in fact, is there are two things. One is that um, this reinforces the idea of oncogene addiction. So we can take a KRAS mutant cell line that's been in culture for decades, in rich media with growth factors and so forth. We can take out KRAS, they can't grow or they die. So this oncogene addiction, we proved it once again using CRISPR. Um, that in fact is a very, very robust phenotype, which gives us hope that we can in fact go after it. The second thing we learned with CRISPR that's very interesting is that when we acutely delete the KRAS oncogene, um, and then we, then we can take these cells into various assays, and what we found is that in the classic 2D monolayer cell culture, which is probably 90% of what we do, um, some KRAS mutant cells are less sensitive to the loss of this KRAS oncogene, for reasons I won't go into. But if we take the same cells that could survive KRAS ablation by CRISPR in 2D monolayer culture and put them in a 3D spheroid culture, which we believe will closely mimic the oncogenic transformation process 
are driven by KRAS because it enables anchorage independent growth of cells. Every single KRAS mutant cell line is absolutely dependent on KRAS for this anchorage independent growth in tumor spheroid. Again, it reinforces this idea that KRAS is a very potent oncogene, and if a cell has it, it needs it all the time. It cannot do without it. It's very difficult to wean the cell of KRAS addiction, particularly in this transformer context. Okay, we'll be moving on. Great, thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Len Neckers from the Urologic Oncology Branch. He got his PhD from the University of Connecticut. He then joined the NCI and became chief of the tumor cell biology section in the medicine branch in 1988. And subsequently, he uh, joined the urologic oncology branch, and he's a senior investigator. And he's going to talk to us today about chaperones and proteostasis. Len. Thank you. So I've done this lecture for a few years now, and I try to vary it a little bit from year to year, uh, focusing on chaperones, but there are so many different aspects of, uh, as to how chaperones are involved in the biology of cells, both healthy and uh, abnormal cells. So today, I'm going to tell you a story that's a little bit different, but related to what I've said in the past, and, and before I get started, uh, I just wanted to put up this uh, slide, which I actually added this afternoon, uh, showing what chaperones do in terms of maintaining the proteostasis or protein homeostasis in cells. So this is very important. I mean, in the past, this has been referred to as housekeeping uh, activities, but that sounds kind of dull. This is a, a lot more significant than it was made to sound in the past. And it's relevant to normal cells. It's relevant to cancer cells. Uh, it's relevant to basically any living system. So what you see here is an energy map uh, that describes the folding process of proteins as they come off the ribosome. and uh, how much energy is, requ is required at different steps. So the green part of this figure is, is where you want proteins to be, at least if you're a normal cell. And you can see that, that uh, the native state of a folded protein is low on the energy scale. So once a protein gets into that state, it's relatively stable. Now, mutated proteins, that, that dip would be much reduced compared to uh, a protein that, that is normal and stable. But you can see that folding intermediates uh, will tend to spontaneously uh, go into that folded state in some cases. In many cases, though, that requires the activity of chaperones. Chaperones also are able to prevent unfolded proteins as, which one of these is, I guess, uh, uh, to prevent unfolded proteins from falling into these orange states here, which you don't want, because those orange states represent degrees of misfolding. And, and you can see that uh, when proteins do misfold and they get into these, into these aggregates or oligomers or fibrils in the worst case, those are extremely stable. And once they form, it's very difficult, as you can see by the depth of uh, the energy curve here, it's very difficult to get them back out into solution and refold it. And so chaperones tend to prevent the misfolding process from occurring. And as I'll show you, they really determine whether a protein is going to be degraded or not, depending on how easy it is for it to fold. So, which one of these did I use? I guess this one. Or, yeah. So 
this is a way of looking at the interaction of the uh, cycles of two major molecular chaperones in the cell. One is HSP70, the other one is HSP90. And, and you can see that they interact with, with each other, not in all cases, but in many cases. And there's, another, there's a co-chaperone of HSP70, the 40 kil, kilodalton uh, co-chaperone, that delivers client proteins to HSP70. So depending on ATP binding and ATP hydrolysis, both HSP70 and HSP90 tend to cooperate in folding proteins that are not able to fold by, by themselves. And, and you can see when proteins go through a number of these cycles, which are repetitive based on uh, nucleotide exchange factors that remove the ADP from both HSP90 and HSP70 and allow ATP to rebind and initiate a new chaperone cycle. If a protein goes through a number of chaperone cycles and is unable to fold, it is transferred to uh, this protein called CHIP, which ubiquitinates the client and targets it for degradation in the proteasome. And both HSP70 and HSP90 use this mechanism to get rid of proteins that are basically not able to fold, because if they didn't do this, you would end up with a protein that falls into this orange area here, and that's big trouble for the cell. So that's the basic background of what chaperones do, and today I'm going to focus uh, primarily on, on an example of how HSB70 is important in chaperoning proteins involved in cancer and how inhibiting HSB70 may be uh, a unique approach to targeting these cancers which have become resistant to other treatments. In the past, I talked about targeting HSB90 for this purpose. In this case, you'll see uh, this particular protein, the antigen receptor in prostate cancer, has figured out how to elude dependence on HSP90, and so it's not affected by HSP90 inhibitors, but it maintains dependence on HSP70 and 40. And so targeting those chaperones still has an effect. So to summarize this small introduction, what molecular chaperones do in general is uh, to be involved in these regular folding pathways that I showed you. They provide quality control of misfolded proteins to prevent aggregation by targeting misfolded proteins to the proteasome. And they regulate the activity of partially folded proteins or metastable proteins. So proteins like kinases, for example, that when they're activated, sometimes by autophosphorylation, tend to uh, change their conformation. And, and in order for them to go from the, the conformation they're in when they're inactive to the conformation that they're in when they're active, there's a requirement for both HSP70 and HSP90 and their co-chaperone. And then lastly, as I mentioned, chaperones are important for preventing aggregation and maintaining the solubility of proteins. And, and getting rid of them by uh, ubiquitination and the proteasome before they can form these aggregates that, that are insoluble and end up tending to kill cells. So as I mentioned, the story I'm gonna tell you today involves HSP70 and 40, which is a co-chaperone of HSP70, so it, it helps HSP70, and I'll show you how it does that. Uh, as a novel strategy to treat castrate-resistant prostate cancer, or CRPC. So CRPC is resistant to uh, tar targeting the ligand binding do domain of the antigen receptor, so uh, anti-hormonal treatments don't work anymore. And there's really, at this point, nothing you can do uh, for 
this type of prostate cancer that has any long lasting activity. So as, as I said, CRPC is associated with a barren expression of nuclear receptors such as the antigen receptor or glucocorticoid receptor. These are members of uh, the family of nuclear receptors. Uh, and one mechanism by which the cells uh, escape uh, dependence on uh, HSP90 and ligand binding altogether uh, the binding of antigen to the receptor is, is due to alternative splicing in which the ligand binding domain is spliced out. So the antigen receptor is generally inactive in the cytoplasm unless antigen binds. The region which antigen binds is called the ligand binding do domain, and that turns out to be where HSP90 binds as well. So for the full length antigen receptor, an HSP90 inhibitor uh, inhibits antigen binding and promotes instability of the receptor, as I'll show you in a minute. Uh, and these, these really uh, top of the line anti-androgen approaches, enzalutamide, which binds to the LBD and prevents antigen from binding, and abiraterone, which inhibits the synthesis of androgen, no longer affect these particular types of prostate cancer because the ligand binding domain is gone. The antigen receptors that are left are constitutively active. And their expression, especially that of ARV7, which is one particular type of spliced isoform, uh, has been shown to correlate with uh, the aggressiveness of CRPC. Another mechanism of resistance to enzalutamide and abiraterone and agents like them is upregulation of the glucocorticoid receptor, which in certain cases can take over some of the functions of the antigen receptor. So a strategy to simultaneously target these nuclear receptors, including the variants of the antigen receptor, was uh, something that we were trying to accomplish. So this is uh, taken from a paper published in 2014. Uh, it's a waterfall plot showing the PSA response after treatment of patients with enzalutamide. The, if the bars go down below zero, that's a good response because the PSA level is dropping. And those are all, except for one exception, the blue bars. If the bars are going up above zero, that's bad because PSA is going up, which designates a progression. So both for enzalutamide and abiraterone-treated patients, uh, you can see that ARV7-negative patients, with very few exceptions, tend to have a really nice response to either of these agents targeting the LBD. However, if ARV7 is present in the tumor, then uh, the tumors essentially ignore the presence of, of, of these drugs. So no, it's, they, they progress on enzalutamide, they progress on abiraterone. So this is a real life uh, example of what I was showing or, or describing to you in the previous slide. Uh, so Jane Treppel, who is also in CCR and, and with whom I collaborate, uh, a number of years ago, set out to, uh, to do a, a small molecule screen, an unbiased screen with a library of molecules, looking for agents that could inhibit uh, transcriptional targets of both the full-length antigen receptor and uh, ARV7. So what I didn't mention is that while there is overlap in the transcriptional targets of ARV7 and the full-length antigen receptor. There are differences as well. And ARV7 will drive the transcription of, of a number of cancer-related genes that are not impacted by the antigen receptor. So these are three examples. K KLK3 is PSA. 
So PSA and Tempris 2 are uh, regulated by both the full-length androgen receptor and ARV7, the variant. Uh, but UBE2C is regulated by the variant, not by the full-length receptor. So a molecule that's able to inhibit uh, transcription of all three of these genes would be a candidate to use in the CRPC models that I just described. So to make a long story short, she used a CRPC-derived cell line called 22RV1, which was derived from a patient's tumor. Uh, this line expresses one allele of the full-length receptor as well as an allele of ARV7. So it, it drives both the uh, standard array of transcriptional targets through the AR and the ARV7, but you can also look at ARV7-specific transcription. I didn't mention at the beginning, but in case you're not aware, these nuclear receptors, uh, when they're activated, they go into the nucleus and they act as, as transcription factors. So their function is to regulate the transcription of a, of a host of genes. They stimulate some, they inhibit others. So that's why we're looking at trans transcriptional targets here. So to make a long story short, this compound in the purple box, C86, was one of the compounds that seemed to inhibit all three transcriptional targets shown here. And biclutamide, which is last on the right uh, with the green arrow, is an example of an anti-androgen a little older than enzalutamide and, and not quite as potent, but you can see here that it's completely inactive in inhibiting the, these genes. So MDV3100 is enzalutamide, and this is just a viability assay uh, looking at cell growth in vitro of 22RV1 cells. Uh, they are completely resistant to any impact of enzalutamide or biclutamide, but their growth inhibited dose dependently by C86. This is a 72-hour exposure assay. So getting back to HSP90 inhibitors for a second, in the, in the blue box, you can see uh, what happens when these cells are exposed to 17 AHE, which was the first in human HSP90 inhibitor, uh, which we discovered and developed here at NCI. You can see that this HSP90 inhibitor is pretty good at causing the degradation of full length antigen receptor, uh, which is uh, shown, it's abbreviated here FLAR within six hours, does a good job at that, but it's completely uh, incapable of affecting expression, in this case, stability of the variant uh, receptor. Uh, that just confirms, and I'll show you again by pull down, confirms that the variant doesn't associate with HSP90, and so it doesn't care if you use an HSP90 inhibitor while the full length receptor does. So the question arose, what is C86? How is it working? So this is the structure of C86 in the upper left. It's, it's called a chalcone. Uh, we were able to biotinylate it away from the active site, and this proved to be very useful in identifying its molecular target in cells. And we've also used an inactive analog of C86 and we were able to biotinylate that as well. So it, it looked a little bit like an HSP90 inhibitor, although we didn't think that it was because you're sure there was no HSP90 involved with the, with the variant. But we looked anyway as the ability of biotinylated C86 to uh, affinity purify HSP90 in lysates from LN cap cells, which are another prostate line. Uh, as controls, we used 
uh, two different HSP90 inhibitors attached to agarose beads, galdanomycin and PUH71. And you can see that they're very good at pulling down HSP90 from the cell lysate in the upper panel, but C86 was not, it was very clean. In the bottom panel, we're looking at purified HSP70 protein to see if perhaps C86 could pull that down, and we were unable to pull down uh, increasing amounts of HSP70, purified HSP70, with biotinylated C86. So the next thing we looked at was 40, because 40 is involved with both HSP90 and HSP70. And luckily for us, it, it looked like C86 was able to, the biotinylated form was able to pull out HSP40 from the lysate of 22RV1 cells as shown in the upper panels. And the inactive analog was completely negative. So this is biotinylated version of the drug. Just to confirm, this, is, this was not unique to 22RV1 cells. We were able to pull 40 out of A549 lysate. It's not a prostate cancer line. And then we bought some recombinant HSB40 protein and showed that C86 was able to affinity purify that as well. The uh, inactive version was of C86 was a little sticky, but much less purified protein came down with that compared to biotinylated C86. So we were somewhat convinced at this point that perhaps C86 was binding to this co-chaperone of HSP70 uh, and causing its effect on the androgen receptor in that fashion. Now, if you remember from the previous slide where I showed the Western blot, C86 was able to promote the degradation of both the full-length antigen receptor as well as the variant, un unlike the HSP90 inhibitor. So what, whatever C86 is doing, it's not distinguishing between the full-length receptor and the, and the variant. And this become, will become important in a couple of slides. So what's the relationship between 40 and 70. So one function of 40 is to deliver client proteins to HSP70 and provide specificity to HSP70 essentially. So <clears throat> when, when, when client bound to 40 associates with HSP70, it stimulates the ATPase activity of HSP70, which causes a conformational change in the chaperone. HSP40 comes off. The client is then handed off in most cases to HSP90 when both sets of chaperones are involved in folding. For HSP70 specific clients, it would then release the client in a folded uh, configuration to do what, whatever it's going to do. As far as the androgen receptor and other nuclear receptors go, it would hand it off to HSP90 because they share the job of folding the LBD. Uh, so we decided to take a closer look at the uh, potential for novel interaction sites of HSP40 and 70 uh, other than the LBD. So this is a model of the, and of, of the of a glucocorticoid receptor that was published a few years ago, uh, showing that HSP70 and HSP90 serve in sequence to inactivate and reactivate ligand binding to the glucocorticoid receptor. And this is, of course, all focused on the ligand binding do domain of the receptor. Similar models have been proposed for the androgen receptor, again, all focusing on the ligand binding domain of the androgen receptor. The HSP70 system unfolds that do domain and the HSP90 system refolds it and holds it until ligand binds. The chaperones are then re released and the ligand bound receptor dimerizes and goes into the nucleus. 
So this has been the standard model of what chaperones do to nuclear receptors. But let's take a closer look for a minute uh, on the androgen receptor, its genetic or organization and exon structure. So androgen receptor is on uh, the X cro chromosome. And uh, the gene transcript here, as you can see, involves eight exons. Uh, the first exon in purple uh, encodes the N-terminal do domain. Uh, the, then there's a DNA binding domain encoded by exons two and three. There's a flexible hinge region that separates the DNA binding domain from the LBD, which is in pink here. And importantly, that's the full length receptor, as you, as you can see. Importantly for ARV7 and a related spliced form of the receptor, ARV567ES, uh, the LBD is spliced out, leaving you with the NTD and the DBD essentially, and a specific peptide that's remaining in ARV7 uh, and another one remaining in uh, 567ES in gray here, which has essentially no function. So uh, this guy is constitutively active, this guy is constitutively active. So since we know that the chaperones are remodeling the LBD, you would say that, well, these the variants are not going to be dependent on these chaperones. Uh, what, how could uh, you use chaperone inhibitors and target them? Well, so our hypothesis was that, in fact, there may be a, another role for 40 and 70 in the NTD, and I'll show you why we thought that in a minute. But what really is, is interesting is, is that when these receptors are in the cytosol and inactive, they don't exist like this. What happens is, is that portions of this LBD, because this is a flexible hinge region here, fold back so that you have sort of a U shape or a magnet shape. And, and regions in the NTD form contacts with the LBD. And what we think may be happening, which now we have more evidence that it could be true, is that 40 and 70 are not at least normally binding to the LBD, HSP90 is. But 40 and 70, if they were binding here in the NTD, could still be uh, interacting with HSP90 because in the cell, this region folds back and basically is adjacent to the LBD in the full length receptor. Anyway, we decided to look and see if 40 and 70 might be binding to the NTD. And I'm just showing you here uh, another version of this. So again, if you have these variants that are spliced where the LBD is gone, there's no impact of enzalutamide, there's no impact of abiraterone, and there's no impact of hormone or HSP90 inhibitor. But our hypothesis was that inhibitors of 70 and 40, inhibitors of 70 already existed. We're assuming C86 is an inhibitor of 40. These could still have an effect. What we did is used an NMR, which is a biophysical approach to look at protein-protein in interactions, uh, basically using uh, mixtures of HSP70 and 40 and androgen receptor, in this case the full-length receptor, we were able to demonstrate that there was interactions in the NTD uh, around this peptide that I've uh, listed down here, uh, which goes from amino acid 23 to 27. And in fact, this is the peptide that is supposed to interact with the LBD in the full length receptor. So this really strengthens our model that maybe the role of 40 and 70 is to stabilize this U-shaped conformation where the NTD folds back over the LBD in the inactive state of the receptor. But anyway, 
Uh, importantly, for what made us think that 40 and 70 might bind to the NTD in the first place, to confirm these interactions with, with, uh, with co-IPs, what we did was use HEC-293 cells, which don't express normally the antigen receptor, and we transfected in flag tag versions of the full-length receptor, which we're labeling FL here, of 567ES, which was one of the variants I showed you, and V7, which is the other one. And, and what you can see on the top is that if you use flag to immunoprecipitate the receptors that we transfected and then blot for endogenous HSP90 and HSP70, you see that HSP90 and HSP70 bind to the full length receptor as they should. But for these variants, there's no HSP90 binding, but in fact, there's still a lot of HSP70 binding. So the NMR data uh, is confirmed by this co-immunoprecipitation data. We then went and looked uh, at this doing it, looking at endogenous 70 and endogenous 90 again, uh, and looking at 40 this time, sorry, not 90, but 40 and 70 in 293 cells after transfection of either the full length flag tag receptor or the variant. And you can see full length, you get 40 along with 70 com coming down when you do the immunoprecipitation. And for the variant, in this case, V7, you get 70 and 40 as well, although the signal is a little bit weaker in this experiment. So in two separate experiments, when we're transfecting the uh, antigen receptors into these 293 cells, we're seeing interactions with 70 and 40, but the 90 is restricted to the full length receptor. That's just the input. So a little bit about 40. So HSB 40 is not one protein, unfortunately, even though it tends to be referred to as one protein. It's actually a conglomeration of 42 proteins that all have uh, in common one structural, uh, one structural do domain, which is known as the J do domain. And this domain is necessary for interaction with HSP70. And as I mentioned, these 40s provide client specificity to HSP70. So while clients of all of these different proteins, these, these chaperones, which are also known as DNAJ proteins because DNAJ is the 40 chaperone found in bacteria, which only has one protein and it's DNAJ. But anyway, uh, even though these are, are vastly uh, different in terms of structure, as you can see here, the only domain they have in common is the J domain. So you remember that for a second. So the other thing that, the, that these chaperones do is to prevent aggregation, which I told you was an important role of molecular chaperones. They facilitate nuclear translocation, which is important for the function of nuclear receptors, and they facilitate the dimerization of their clients, which is also critical for androgen receptor function, including the variants, which can dimerize to itself or to the full length receptor. So I'm just showing this to show you that, that even though it's convenient to think of 40 as one protein is really a, a, a conglomeration of proteins that only have one motif in common, but functionally they tend to do similar things. And some clients will bind to some of these and other clients will bind to others. So this is what the J domain looks like. HDJ1 is one of the, uh, the DNA Js in, in human cells. And as you can see, just looking at this, the similarity between the bacterial DNA J on the left and the human version on the right is really striking. The, the other thing 
that I've diagrammed here is, is this loop region between these motifs two and three. It appears that this loop region is very important in positioning uh, these regions two and three appropriately to interact with 70 because this motif here, HPD, uh, based on, on what the amino acids are, if you mutate any residue in this three amino acid motif, you can disrupt binding to HSP70. And you can see that the motif is maintained uh, between from bacteria to human. So, and clearly it's very important. So we collected a number of flag tag versions of these DNA Js, and they arbitrarily divided into three classes, A, B, and C, uh, based on their over, overall structural motifs besides the J domain. And uh, I'm just showing this to show that biotinylated C86 is able to pull down examples uh, from classes A, B, and C. And in fact, we've looked so far at about 25 of the 42 proteins that make up the family, and C86 recognizes them all. So clearly, it has to be recognizing a motif that's shared among all these proteins, and that motif, the only motif that's shared, is the J domain. So, so back to this HPD motif, I told you that if you make a mutation, and any of these amino acids that disrupts binding to 70, a, a pretty common one that people use is mutating the histidine uh, shown here uh, to Q, and that disrupts binding to 70. So we got a hold of this mutant and we wanted to see if it also interfered with binding of biotinylated C86. Uh, so we have two different J proteins here, B6B and B8, comparing wild type and the H to Q mutant for being recognized by biotinylated C86. And you can see that uh, whether you uh, express them in COS7 cells or HEC293 cells, this mutation has a marked effect on recognition by C86, which is more evidence that it's not only binding to the J domain, but likely requires the right orientation of these regions two and three. And uh, just to show you the inputs uh, from which these IPs are made, uh, you can get equivalent e expression of both the mutant protein and the wild type protein. And, and here we're confirming that uh, the uh, bead control is completely negative. So this is real binding. Okay, so I probably can skip this slide, but I just want to emphasize the, the fact why we started focusing on the amino terminal part of, of the NTD to begin with, because there's a poly-Q expansion track in this region. Even in the normal wild type androgen receptor, there's a, a run of Qs. I'm showing here that in normal androgen receptors, you can have a, a string of 20 Qs. And this tends to promote unfolding of local structure and aggregation. And if there are neurodegenerative diseases where this tract of cues is dramatically expanded, sometimes 60, 80, 100 cues in a row, these proteins spontaneously misfold and, and they kill the neurons that they're expressed in and, and lead to particular kinds of neurodegeneration uh, that's hereditary. So we knew this poly-Q tract was here and suspected that even in the wild type receptor, which obviously is soluble and functional, there may still be a requirement for HSB40 and HSB70 to keep them so soluble and functional, which is why we started looking. So the next thing we did was use the biotinylated C86 to pull HSP40 out of 22 RV1 cells. This is the endogenous protein. And it's DNAJB1 or HDJ1 for which we have an antibody. So 
it's probably pulling out a bunch of 40s from these cells, but the one we have an antibody to uh, is HDJ1, and so that's what we're looking at here. But remember I told you that there was no direct binding to 70 when we looked at biotinylated C86. Now we're seeing binding to 70, and uh, clearly it has to be part of a chaperone comp complex that is being pulled out by C86, which is leading us to speculate that C86 binding is trapping this complex of the client protein, which are the antigen receptors 40 and 70, and, and preventing further cycling of the chaperone system as shown in the cartoon. The other thing we noticed when we looked at these pull downs more carefully is this protein chip, which if you were looking carefully at one of the early cartoons I showed, is the protein responsible for ubiquitinating clients of 70 and 90 that cannot be folded and must be degraded by the proteasome. So the fact that chip was recruited to this complex in the presence of C86 suggests to us that CHIP is going to promote their degradation. So I think I will skip this and uh, skip this for now. So does C86 promote the degradation of AR and ARV? Well, I showed you at the beginning in, in the one model that we were looking at, which in fact, was 22RV1 that we're using here. That happened. So here we're looking again at six hours and different doses of C86. And you can see there's dose-dependent loss of full-length AR and ARV7. Uh, the reason why there are two ARVs here is that the antibody we're using for the full-length receptor is targeted to the NTD, and so it will pick up variants as well. So ARV7 is definitely contained in this bunch of proteins, but there may be other var variants there also. So we're not calling this ARV7, but there is a specific antibody for ARV7, which we're using here. Anyway, the degradation is, is quite significant and occurs relatively quickly, and it's dose-dependent. And it's also time-dependent, if you look, sorry, if you look at uh, one concentration, in this case, 10 micromolar C86, you can see significant protein loss within three hours already. And it's all gone by six hours. Then we're not killing the cells at this point. The tubulin expression remains normal. So this is a specific effect. Uh, we're looking at another CRPC model here called VCAP also expresses V7 and full-length receptor. And again, you see that degradation occurs within six hours and it's dose-dependent and uh, time-dependent as well. So can we block this degradation by putting in a proteasome inhibitor? So that's a pretty standard way of uh, showing that something is degraded by the proteasome when it works. So if you just focus on uh, this series of, of bands here, which is a time course after cyclohexamide, so we've stopped the synthesis of new protein, and we're looking at the half-life of existing protein. So over the time we chose to look at, which is six hours, the full-length receptor and the variant, at least V7, uh, they're both kind of stable between zero and six hours after cyclohexamide. But in the presence of C86, uh, you see that, that they're not stable. Uh, ev everything is degraded. And if you put in a proteasome inhibitor, MG132, you'd expect there'd be recovery of protein here. But in fact, you don't see it in the soluble fraction, you do see it in the insoluble pellet. So what that suggests to us is that 
when C86 is present, inhibiting or, or trapping a 4070 client complex altogether, if you prevent the ubiquitination and degradation of that client, then the protein aggregates becomes insoluble and ends up in this detergent insoluble fraction. So because these are, are uh, transcriptionally active proteins, we wanted to look at transcriptional activity. I already showed you in the top the, the three target genes that are all inhibited by C86, but we added a couple of new ones uh, since the initial study was done. NDRG1 is driven by the full-length receptor and EDN2 is driven by V7, and we're using a doxycycline-inducible model here. We can turn on ARV7 expression when we want, but the cell background remains the same. In any case, both uh, proteins are transcriptionally, the, the transcription of both uh, M -M mRNAs are markedly inhibited by C86. And this was done in collaboration with Nancy Weigel's lab at Baylor. So uh, I will move along a little quickly here. Here we're transfecting cells, in this case 22RV1, with uh, flag HSP70. And we're looking at pulling down endogenous uh, full-length receptors and ARVs as well as HSP70. P40, the endogenous, which is HDJ1, because that's what we have an antibody to. So because HSB70 is coming down, we thought we should look at inhibiting HSB70 and see if it looks like what we get when we inhibit HSB40. To do that, we started a collaboration with Jason Guestwicki at uh, UCSF in California. He spent a long time developing allosteric HSB70 inhibitors. This is uh, one of his better ones, JG98. And the first thing we noticed is that like C86, JG98 is cytotoxic for 22RV1 cells. So that uh, was a good sign. When we looked at uh, the antigen receptor, it was destabilized by JG98 in almost an identical fashion uh, in 22RV1 cells as happened after C86. This is another version of his HSB70 inhibitor that is, has more in vivo activity uh, due to enhanced PK and other properties, but its mechanism of action is identical. And just showing in vitro Western blotting here, it behaves exactly like JG98 in promoting the degradation of these receptors. So here we're, we're speculating that JG98 we know, according to Jason's data, binds to the ADP-induced conformation of HSP70. Again, re uh, recruiting CHIP, that's been shown uh, to promote the degradation in the proteasome. So, so far, this is mechanistically quite similar to C86. The HSP70 complexes may be a little different, but uh, otherwise, it's pretty similar. However, when we did the soluble versus insoluble experiment after uh, cyclohexamide addition and proteasome inhibitor addition, you see that unlike inhibiting HSP40, inhibiting HSP70 does cause an increase in the soluble forms of both the ARV and the full length receptor. So in contrast to 40, Inhibition of 70 does not cause aggregation of these receptors. That seems to be more of a 40 thing. As long as HSB40 is there, the protein is going to remain in soluble form. Again, looking at gene expression, we get inhibition of all, of all three candidates. Looking at the newer ones, NDRG1 and, and EDN2, Depending on whether you induce ARV7 expression or not, both uh, transcription of both targets also inhibited, like with C86. Uh, just show quickly here, we wanted to be able to target the glucocorticoid receptor as well. And this just shows 
that the glucocorticoid receptor is sensitive to destabilization, just like the androgen receptor. Transcriptional activity is a little harder to do. We had to go to a yeast system shown on the bottom where we have a GRE reporter assay. And uh, C86 is very good at inhibiting that activity without inhibiting the basic uh, promoter driving the reporter. Uh, JG98 could not be used in these experiments because it interfered with the detection of, of the reporter. But C86 was clearly able to inhibit the GR transcription. Uh, I can skip this. because So we want to do an in vivo experiment. And uh, in the top, we're looking at C86, which has not been optimized for in vivo use, and yet we're still able to see some growth inhibition of these tumors. Uh, JG2 31, which as I mentioned is more optimized for in vivo use, has, has a better growth inhibitory effect. And importantly, the combination of the two drugs at lower doses seems to have a combinatorial effect, which you can see looking at the individual tu tumor volumes here in the lower right. So we use doses that on their own, of these inhibitors that on their own were not effective. But together, they significantly inhibited the growth of these tumors. These are measurements are taken at this last time point here. Now, importantly, we'd like to be able to ultimately use these agents, not by themselves, but to restore sensitivity to uh, either enzalutamide and or abiraterone. That would be really a, a home run. And so we have some preliminary data here. This is in vitro data showing that we, we do seem to be able to see some additivity at least, if not uh, restoration of sensitivity to both enzalutamide and abiraterone when we include moderate doses of C86 uh, in this case, or JG998. But We've done one in vivo experiment, which I think is more convincing, uh, just with JG90, with JG231, showing that lo low doses of uh, JG231, four milligrams per kilogram, which is actually half the dose where you would see single agent activity, overlaps the no treatment control in terms of tumor growth. There's a slight effect of enzalutamide, although it's not significant, because there's still one full length allele in these tumors. And so you are going to have some impact on reducing the overall androgen receptor. The full length one will be sensitive to enzalutamide, but the fact that this green line is going up as, as fast as it does is due completely to ARV7. So the, the orange curve is the combination of JG, the HSP70 inhibitor, and enzalutamide. And, and you can see that. Uh, this is clearly, uh, the growth is, is significantly inhibited compared to either enzalutamide alone or this low dose of the 70 inhibitor alone. And this is significant as shown here. So this is the beginning of being able to look at uh, repeating this with C86 and doing some, some other things to see if we can restore sensitivity of these CRPC tumors uh, to the standard of care therapy, which uh, tends to be now a combination of enzalutamide and abiraterone. And that would really be great because the longer you can get the tumors to respond to those agents, the longer uh, that you're going to get marked inhibition of, of tumor growth in vivo. So this just summarizes what I've said that a combination of C86 and JG98, the HSP40 inhibitor and the HSP70 inhibitor, have overlapping, probably similar effects on both full-length androgen receptor, as well as these variants lacking the LBD, as well as the glucocorticoid receptor. And so you can target multiple uh, mechanisms of resistance to enzalutamide and, and abiraterone with this approach. So we don't expect that 
these chaperone inhibitors will be used by themselves, but together with these other standard agents. And I just wanted to end with this one slide again. So we've known for a long time now that when you inhibit HSP90, what happens to the client protein is it's basically fed into this, this chip ubiquitination system, causing its degradation ultimately in the proteasome. Now we know that if you inhibit HSB40 or HSB70, clients in that part of uh, a chaperone cycle are also fed into this chip system. So even though we're talking about completely different chaperone cycles, uh, including proteins that are totally resistant and independent of HSP90, ultimately, if you inhibit the appropriate chaperones, you still get the same effect. The clients are delivered to CHIP, which ubiquitinates it, and then promotes degradation in the proteasome. And with that, I will stop. And uh, if anybody has any questions. Well, that's an actually interesting question. So <laughs> it turns out that uh, I can't say this is true for every cancer model, but we've explored this in a number of kidney cancer models. If you uh, prevent oxidation or prevent ROS, scavenge ROS, uh, with either ascorbic acid or other scavengers, uh, bortezomib, which is clinically approved proteasome inhibitor, is pretty much inactive in, in doing anything to, to uh, in kidney cancer models in terms of growth inhibition, even in vitro. If, if you promote ROS accumulation by treating cells with H2O2 or increasing NERF2 and all that, uh, then proteasome inhibitors become very active. So there seems to be a synergistic effect of, of an oxidative environment, potentially because of ROS production, but maybe other reasons as well, on, on proteasome activity. So if you're going to give a proteasome inhibitor to someone, you don't want them taking a lot of vitamin C, drinking green tea, all that stuff, which you would normally want to do. For uh, bortezomib, at least, it really needs an oxidative environment. I don't know why, but it does. And that'll do it, All right. Thank you very much.